Okay, so we need to cover parasitology. And we, there's a bunch of stuff on this screen that all goes with parasitology. So when we come back to that, or when we look at it again, I hope that you'll understand a little bit more of what you're seeing. Okay. Um, More parasitology, more often than not, what we look at are stools. Um, we get ONPs, which are ova and parasite um, collections, and typically you get three fresh stools from different days, so you don't collect all three on one day. Um, you collect them within a 10 day period, and hopefully they when we get them when when the person collects them they are given um, a pair pack to put their stool in and there's a little scooper to to get the school stool and put it in the, the um uh, formalin and saf or pva whichever it is um that will help to preserve it and that gives you to, on the side of the container it shows you, it has a line that says uh, it has to be filled up to here or don't go above here or something like that um and so i will show you guys those when we get into class again but these <coughs> stools um are collected and then they come to us in preservative and if we can have a fresh stool so we actually get one in a container that didn't come in a pair pack um, and it's comes to us fresh fresh from say an inpatient um, and we get it within 30 minutes of collection we can actually make a wet mat wet mount to see if we can see anything moving in it so uh, then we would know that the critters are there and they're live and they're moving and now we just have to process them to identify them right. um, <clears throat> but the typically what we're looking for we're, when we're looking at stuff we're using the 10 percent formalin um, and then the saf or pva for two different purposes uh the formalin is typically there for us to um look for um things that we don't have to stain to identify so if we can find trophozoites or worms or filaria or something large um in the formalin that would be good the saf um or PVA, PVA is polyvinyl alcohol. SAF. Um, but it's a safer alternative to um, some of the other, like using the PVA or um, formalin. Um, I'm looking, where's SAF? Can't find it anywhere. Sodium acetate acetic acid formula. Okay. Um, PVA and, and FS, SAF are predominantly for staining purposes. So when you have to stain things to identify structures inside of cysts or trophs or whatever, we need to use the SAF or the PVA. And PVA is the preferred um fixative or or preservative for trichrome stains okay um saf doesn't do so hot with the with that we would much rather have the pva for trichrome um but <clears throat> pva has you know it's it's kind of going by the wayside i think because there's a little bit of mercury in there so um you know they're trying to go more with saf 
with with the SAF we end up with uh, really poor trichrome stains and then that's actually we'd have to use the iron hematoxylin stains which are way more complex and harder to use um, so if your pro procedure or your how you do it your performance of the staining process is not dead on or you there's too much saf in the in the feces in the sample then it turns out into to not stain well at all um so <clears throat> So we need three stools collected different days within 10 days. Okay. Three fresh stools within 10 days. The formalin we use more for the wet mounts and looking at them um, to see what what we actually can see there. So um, and if we ever have to do any immunoassay testing to determine if something's present we would have to use the formula you can't use the other fixatives to do that right. so first thing we do when we get a specimen in is we have to look at it okay so if it's, we're getting a stool in a cup that's not put in the OMP pet, OMP um, containers um, first we're looking to see is there any urine contaminating it um that's the first thing because urine being at a different at a different ph is going to um be toxic to a lot of the different organisms that we're looking for so that's not going to help us so urine can't be there if the, the person had had um some sort of contrast media given to them like a barium enema or something like that um one that where you have to swallow the contrast for what CT scans and stuff like that or well do they inject I don't remember but there's ones that you have to swallow and hold that you have to have it in you for a certain period of time and then they do the imaging any of that stuff in the feces that's going to be cause for rejection okay um, then what we're going to do is we're going to look to see what the consistency of the stool is. Is it a form stool? If it's a form stool, there's a really good likelihood that you are not going to find any parasites in there because most of the parasites cause diarrhea um, or a loosening of the, the, the stool. So um, form stools, at one place that I worked, a form stool for oviparasite was immediately rejected. Other ones that we do them, um on the form stools you know it just it de depends on what your policy is at your place um but then you're going to look for if is it liquid or is it soft or semi liquid semi solid um or is it completely formed so as the veterinarians tend to say liquid is liquid semi-solid or soft looks like a cow pie and formed looks like a tube doesn't matter if it's hard tube or soft tube as long as it looks like a tube it's formed okay um and then you look to see if is there can you see any blood can does it look mucusy do you see you know some mucus on there or not and then you also want to look for any visible parasites so there are, it is possible to see worms in feces um or even parts of worms so the proglottids of tapeworms or little square pieces you can see those in with your visible eye um with your naked eye yeah with your eye without a microscope okay. <clears throat> Then, of course, we have to look at these stuff mac microscopically. Um, and if we're doing, you're doing wet mounts, um, the timing is everything. So if you have a liquid stool and it came fresh to you within 30 minutes, you can look, do a wet mount on it and be fine. Um, this background on this page. Um, or on this slide shows a wet mount, but if you'll notice, everything looks kind of yellow. 
one of the things that we would do regularly is you do a wet mounts on fresh fresh stools you put a little iodine in it to help give it contrast so the 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 structures will take on that yellowy color so that we can actually see <clears throat> um what's there and what's not <clears throat> If it's a semi-solid or soft stool, you have 60 minutes from passage. If it is form stool, meaning that it's in a tube, tube-like substance, um, you have more time, 24 hours. Okay. <clears throat> you want to take an applicator stick and smear a very thin smear on to your microscope slide, and, and then you're going to cover slip. Um, sometimes with the form stools, you might need to add just a touch of sealing so that you can make a mount. Um, and <clears throat> then you're going to look at the whole entire, um, slide on 10, flip to 40, to at least half of it. That's my thing. It says a third to half of it to at least half of it on 40. If you see anything that looks suspicious, you need to go into those the thin areas that you find and look around on 100 if you can okay, to identify what you're seeing. If you see um, larvae, you see little... Um, I like to call them teen worms. If you see any worms, if you see sifts, if you see tropes, um, if you see any eggs, you have to report them out and you have to actually tell them um, what the species of the organism is and then what stage it is. Um, and then, of course, if you see any yeast or blood cells, you have to tell them what they are. Um, and then these spindle shaped things on the background of this slide are the charcot laden crystals that are there um that may be there um if there were actually eosinophils um in the stool that have broken down all right <clears throat> so once you look at the fresh specimen wet mount which does not always happen so you know um, then we're going to have to start processing it. <clears throat> so there's, there are different types of sedimentation methods. Um, the go-to used to be the FES method, the formalin ethyl acetate sedimentation method. Um, and have to tell you that they're trying to get away from the ethyl acetate. So now, you know, that sedimentation method is a little bit different. Um, but still it's, it's around. Um, but what you end up doing is you, you mix the organism or the, the specimen in with the FES, you mix it. Um, you don't shake it like, vigorously but you you mix it um like a rapid rocking not not um the gentle rock that we do with hematology tubes but a kind of a rapid rocking to mix it pretty well put it in the centrifuge centrifuge it and what happens is that um the sediment is where you should find the parasites okay now, this method also allows for some fecal contamination to, to sediment, to, to settle at the bottom. So, there's where you see this plug of debris. Most of the stuff there, so like the cellulose fibers and stuff like that, all that crap from the fiber or from the stool will, will go up there. But you're still going to get some things that are going to be small enough and... and um, heavy enough to be able to come into the sediment. So you are going to see a little bit more um, cont fecal contamination in here. Um, with the zinc sulfate flotation method um, instead, and I couldn't find a picture on that, the, 
the all the parasites would be floating on the top. Um, the problem with that is that like any operculated eggs, which I'm going to talk to you about those later, lots of times they'll open up or they'll, they'll just crush. Um, so it's like the integrity of, of what you you're looking for isn't always, um, maintained with the zinc sulfate flotation method. And then we're going to do some iodine staining on these things or, and, or trichrome staining. Um, the trichrome staining, remember we, when we do the trichrome stain, we're going to do it on those already, the, uh, the PVA, um, preserved specimen, right? Trichrome stains have wonderful results showing us lots of different structures inside of the parasitic trophs and, and, and cysts. So, um, it works really well and it shows a lot of detail. Iron heme toxin stain, again, you can see a lot of detail on many of these. But if it's not done properly, um, and sometimes it's, it's difficult to get it to come out right. Um, but this is best with that SAF preservative. Um, the iron hemotoxylin stains are, are the, the next best, um, thing. All right. <clears throat> Here we go. Nematodes. Um, oh, before I go to nematodes, sorry. Sometimes, sometimes, um, we get things other than stools in. So sometimes you, you'll get, um, duodenal aspirates or, or, um, urethral or vaginal specimens. So like sometimes we get those those wet mounts that we would be looking for yeast and things. And sometimes we see, um, trichomonas vaginalis in it. Well, that's a protozoan. That's actually, you just identified a parasite. Okay. Um, so you have to understand that, you know, when I, when we're talking about parasitology, primarily we're talking about looking at ova and parasite parasites. Um, but we can find them anywhere. We can find them in urines, um, we can find them in when they're doing GI scopes, upper or lower, and they get, collect tissues and stuff. You might find them in there as well. Okay. So when, when we're looking at, um, blood smears, you might find malaria, right? Uh, so malaria, again, it's a parasite. So it's it's you have to keep an open mind when you're looking around on those slides okay. um okay nematodes so nematodes are round ones <clears throat> and um we have a handful that you have to know all of these are worldwide they're found worldwide all over the place except for the last one, Dracunculus medinensis. That is <clears throat> almost taken care of. Um, but there are four, there are currently four, um, sorry, at the time of me developing this in 2018, then we had four countries um, in Africa that still had guinea worm um, present in their populations. And this used to be horribly, horribly popular. It was like all over the place. So just, you know, we'll, we'll learn more about that later. Um, but so I'm going to start with these and try and go in order. I think I tried to go in order, um, with these, uh, you need to know the real name. You need to know the, slang name um 
and you need to know what they look like. So here we go. Um, Ascaris lumbricoides <clears throat> is the most common helminth infection worldwide. So the most common worm that anybody gets worldwide. Okay. Uh, it is a, it's called, it is a very large intestinal roundworm. Um, and it is most common in uh, the tropics or subtropics, but it's also very common in areas with inadequate sanitation. So, interestingly enough, um, we have Ascaris lumbricoides infections reported in the United States um, on a pretty regular basis, usually in the rural areas of Southeast U.S. So, that's like Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, um, Georgia, but here's another piece that goes with it whenever they have like hurricanes and and stuff like that the levee breaks in louisiana and everybody gets flooded that those events contribute to ascaris lubricoides um because these helmets are um, they're present and then when they get moved around with water and stuff and then your sanitation processes aren't the same as they normally are or normally would be with the sewage and whatnot um, then the the prevalence um, or incidence rather goes up so it becomes a problem um, so this is a penny i have i have one i have um ascaris in a little block that you guys can see in the male and the females um you can't really see on here but this guy here has a little hook on his end he comes out and he, he has a little um curve to his the end um so and that's typically how you can tell the difference between a male and a female um but these are the eggs okay this is a picture of the egg um so this is when it's fertile but and this is where um we break down the outer coating so it's decorticated um and then this is once it's fertilized and it's now got an embryo in it and then this one is where there's not an embryo in it Okay, as you can see from this one, you can see that thickened, rough exterior that's wavy, and then you see the little wormy guy inside. He's actually fertilized, embryonated, ascaris egg. Okay. So what happens is if you can ingest one of these guys, right? It goes into the intestine, and it hatches out, and it starts taking in. Um, nutrients and blah 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 and then usually if you're taking one you're taking in more than one because they don't come in singles usually um but there is a male and a female of this but most worms are hermaphrodite hermaphroditic hermaphrodites right um so they can self-replicate um fertilize themselves so they'll go into the intestine and they get into the intestine and and they grow and, and get big and they become worms okay um and typically at night while you're resting and you're sleeping and you're not modal and and doing everything that you normally do in a day they will then crawl up the gi tract up to like the respiratory area so this is why you see worms coming out of the nose and mouth of this child um because they're they're coming out while they're sleeping while they're resting okay um and then they can lay eggs out on the surface they and then they go back down into the the intestines again um and they just they just keep letting this cycle go on and on and on now if enough of them are present okay it can cause an occlusion or an obstruction in the bowel which means that then you have to take out the bowel um but 
if you recognize the fact that it may have been a parasite, parasitic condition, um, and you give medications that will take care of the roundworm metabolism and it will stop them in their tracks, you will take a dose, a dose, and the next time that you um, defecate, that you're going to see mass that comes out like big time. All right. Um, so there are stories of people who have gone um, to other countries. They come back, they're going to the bathroom, they're wiping themselves, and they feel something hanging out of the rectum, and it's a worm. And they go to the doctor and like, I found this coming out of, <laughs> out of, out of my anus. Um, I need medication. So it, it very common to see these all over the place. So, um, be very aware that it could happen to you. Um, when, <clears throat> When um, we talk about this next one, keep in mind, this also can happen to you no matter what age you are. So it's important to recognize the symptoms and signs. Um, Enterobius vermicularis is known as pinworm or seat worm. Um, it very commonly affects children um, and what they, what they have or what their most common complaint is, is itchy butt. Okay. So they are itching around the anus. Um, that happens particularly at night because the adult females, um, will crawl out of the anus at night to lay her eggs in the anal folds. Um, and then what happens is she goes and crawls back inside and we have itchy butt because there was movement around there. The kid itches their butt. Um, and the next thing you know is they're sucking on their fingers or biting their nails or um, playing with toys. And then they put the toy in their mouth. It happens all the time. That's why it like, happens more commonly with kids. Um, but the other thing is that those, those eggs that were laid in the anal folds can get into the pajamas. They can get into the bed sheets. They can get like all over the place. So when mom goes and goes to do the wash or take, goes to strip the bed and like doesn't roll sheets, um, those eggs can be ingested or inhaled. And guess what? It'll all go down to the same place. It all goes to the intestines and then she, they, mom ends up with um itchy butt so uh <laughs> it's very real concern now cool thing is that that's pretty much all that happens is that they get itchy butt and because these this is happening a lot at night they're not getting enough sleep and they get cranky and irritable because their butt itches all night long um and it, you don't understand why they're cranky and irritable, but they're not sleeping well. So if your kid normally sleeps dead flat out like a rock, and then all of a sudden you hear a lot of tossing and turning um, during the night and whatnot, um, check their butt. Just saying. Um, so <clears throat> what you can do um, to find females or eggs is we call them it, it's a pinworm paddle or a scotch tape prep so uh in the book it talks about putting cellophane tape on a tongue blade um which is a tongue depressor you wrap and put tape the sticky side out so that you can get in like where the anal folds are between the butt cheeks um to pick up any adults um, or the eggs and then um here's your scotch tape prep and there's there's actually an adult pinworm uh these they only get 
to be like half an inch long. They're about a centimeter long. Um, so the adults, the adult females that we find, they're, like I said, uh, one centimeter, about half an inch long. So they are readily visible in stool. Okay. Um, very, very interestingly enough, we had a couple of years ago, we did the STEM and we taught kids about, you know, we were, cause these were, you know, middle school, high school, elementary, they all come, you know, whoever's interested as a kid can come to these STEM expos. And we did the parasitology. And one of the things that we did was anaerobius vermicularis so that everybody would understand what it is and that you can get this and, and be what to be on the lookout for. And about two months after that, I get a text message from one of my instructor friends. I am so glad that my son went to your STEM expo booth because he recognized a worm in his stool. <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> but he, he was, I think he was like nine, eight or nine. And like you talk about itchy butt and you're not sleeping well and blah, 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 blah. And the kid was like, yeah, that's me. That's me. That's me. And so then he started looking at his poop and he went and got his mom and said, Hey mom, I got something for you to see. I think I have warm in my poop. And that's what happened. And then, so like the whole daycare, um, was like, they were extra cautious with cleaning everything and all that, because you know, accidental self-contamination is a big thing but when you're not all by yourself and you have other kids in the house or you have kids uh, you know you go to daycare you could accidentally be putting it everywhere um this kid is a little um ocd about making sure his hands are washed properly and stuff like that so i don't think that was going to be an issue with the with the uh daycare room or anything but um, it was, it was interesting. She's like, so we're treating the entire family and I now have my house to clean thoroughly deep clean this week, next week, and the following week so that we can get through our two doses of the parental palm weight. So a single dose is effective, but then if there were any eggs inside, they, they'll hatch out. Um, in like two weeks. So it tells you that you should re redo it. Then she did just to make sure she did three treatments for everybody. It won't hurt you. So it's, it's okay. But, <laughs> um, anybody two years and up can take this stuff and it's over the counter. You find it really easily. Okay. But this is what we see. So what, you can see them with the naked eye, but sometimes when you don't and what you see on wet mounts and whatnot, or this is the adult. More commonly, this is all we ever see. We see the eggs. We find the eggs. We can find the eggs in urine. We can find them in, um, interestingly enough, you can find them in sputum. You can find them in, um, Ascaris is more common to find in sputum, but you can find these things also in, um, stool. So urine and stool are typically the more common routes that we find these in. Um, just because we find them in young kids. Um, so these eggs are notoriously known as a flattened football. So it's got the oblong shape to it, but it's got a flatter side on one side than the other. I'm like, it looks like, a, a one of those chibati rolls, whatever, like the rounder ones, the football rolls. Um, but with the flat side and it's only half raised. Um, that's what I think of. The pinworm paddles are super, super nice to get. Um, but <clears throat> a lot of places don't do that because it's a whole lot cheaper just to use cellophane. Okay. Um, but pinworm paddles, they're sticky on both sides. Uh, so you take it, you put it between the anal folds, you take it out. And then what you do is when you get them in the, in the lab, you can either use the paddle as a slide 
or you wipe both sides of the paddle onto a slide. Um, but yeah, I've only done one pinworm paddle in all my life. I've done, I can't tell you how many scotch tape preps. Um, but one pinworm paddle. It was super nice to be able to use because you could just use the paddle as a slide. It was really nice. You just pull it out of the cap and set it on the, the microscope and, and look at the slide. It's nice. But um, scotch tape prep works just as easily. It doesn't matter if it's it, the best is to have the, the clear scotch tape, but this translucent stuff works too. So so far, we've done Ascaris lumbricoides, which have round, um, thick outer layer eggs, okay, rough on the outside more times than not, um, very long adult worms, they're not, well, some of them can get to be like uh, 10 12 inches long the ones that I have in the little block they're like four and six inches long I think so you you'll see them I'm, I'll show them to you um and then the anaerobius vermicularis pinworms yeah <clears throat> all right so trichurus trichuria is a whipworm and these are very very common in um veterinary practices you know they see a lot of these things in in animals um this is the third most common roundworm worldwide and in the year 2002 which less than 20 years ago we had a billion cases on a year a billion cases in a year worldwide that's not saying u.s those are not u.s numbers okay just saying um but they call them whipworms because here's the adult female right and then you see this long skinny tail that looks like a whip and there's the male you know and again long skinny tail that looks like a whip we don't normally see the worms just saying we don't normally see the worms the worms are actually pretty darn big um but we don't normally see the worms what we identify typically are the the eggs and these eggs are nice size and i mean pretty big oval egg but what happens is the ends have these plugs on them they, that don't stain so um if you see something that looks oval and it's dark and then each end is light colored whipworm it's very, very easy. So, Trachuris, Trachura, okay, whipworms. <clears throat> so, unstained plugs, they call them plugs. So, this is an actual iodine wet mount right there. And as you can see, they're very dark no matter what they're in, whether it's iodine or not. Okay. Um, most people don't even know that they have it. So if we find them, it's a big surprise to them. All you have to do is, again, give them some parental penalty. It'll take care of it. Um, mabendazole or albendazole is the primary medication used for worms and the reason for that is because what it does is it blocks the metabolic processes in them it won't allow them to like if it was a hookworm or something it won't allow them to be able to grip on um to the intestinal wall and it allows the whole flushing out of the worms so that's one of the ways that we can get rid of them Okay, Trichinella spir spiralis is a um, is some is a worm that causes trichinellosis, um, and this guy is primarily um, isolated through muscle tissue, so we don't normally 
see um, worms, and we don't normally see the um, the eggs on this thing. Um, what we normally end up getting uh, from this is if somebody is having leg pains and things like that, and there there's lumps starting. Then they were like, what the heck is going on with this person? And that's what we end up finding out is that they've got this trichinosis or trichinosis. Um, and the trichinosis typically um, <clears throat> comes from eating um, not well cooked meat. Okay. Now, I didn't say uncooked meat because that's that's an option too but if it's not cooked well enough to be able to kill all of the stuff off that is the one that we run into um <clears throat> that we that we see a problem with um they don't um we don't see this as often as we once did um wild game is more common the source of the trichinella spiralis than um you know your normal pork okay um you won't get this from a cow you get this from rodents you get this from bears you get this from pork Right. And since pork, most of the pork, the pork that is sold in the United States has been um, inspected. That's why we don't see a lot of trichinella spiralis from from pork. Um, now, wild boar, the game, um, wild game, then yes, we're starting to see a little bit more of that. Um, but what happens is the in the let me see there you go in the mussels um larvae form little cysts in there and those larval cysts uh, the larvae will get out of that little cyst or capsule um and go into the intestine and then it'll mature into an adult and then the adult can, um, I don't have the, sorry, I don't have the life cycle on here. Um, then that, that little, little, um, will become an adult and then it goes out, um, gets carried all, all the way through the place and the, the adult female, um, can produce more larvae and then they go, um, into the circulation they carry throughout the body they'll get to some striated muscle and then the larvae go in there and they go into that little capsule um, and they can last in those little capsules in your muscles for years and years and years um, but eventually they'll die off okay in the intestinal phase when they get into the intestine and mom's making new babies um, Individuals might experience some symptoms like um, some abdominal pain or, or um, nausea, a little maybe a little diarrhea, um, but most of the time everything is not so not very um, bad. So a lot of people could could very well um be infected with this and never know it so whatever you do if you eat wild game of any sort you always make sure that it is cooked thoroughly um especially like if you do muskrat or um squirrels any of those guys um any bear meat and any wild boar so uh, so that you just don't have to worry about those larvae ingesting any larvae and then them growing in your muscles because 
and what you see is you have muscle muscle achy muscle weakness um sometimes you you'll get um a swelling or a bump and it's like what in the world is that i don't know what that is and then people they'll you know most of the time they'll be like put ice on and see what happened blah 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 blah, blah. but um after it doesn't go down and it's not hot and it's not swollen and it's not blah 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 um then and only then may somebody think wait let's look at the actual muscle tissue itself and then we get a histology smear and we're like yep oh, yep there we go let's give them some medication and we will take care of that but like i said lots of people can live with this larvae in their in their legs for years and then all that happens is the larvae will die off if they don't escape and go out among um, and go back to the intestines <clears throat> you see trichinella spiralis spiralis we see southeast or sorry southwest u.s mexico and there's a little band across like kentucky west virginia not not west virginia kentucky um arkansas uh tennessee right right over this way and a little bit into virginia north carolina um along the eastern seaboard of south america and the little tiny west coast of south america and then europe europe is huge for trichinella spiralis spiralis um and then up in Canada, there's another Trichinella spiralis, Nelsoni, um, and then some parts of Africa. Notice that the whole right side, Asia, um, and like Australia, is, they, they don't have to worry about that. You know why? The bears there are different. Different bears. Don't have to worry about them. Um, <clears throat> okay. So... Dracunculus medinensis is the guinea worm. And I told you earlier that the guinea worm used to be like huge as a, as a worldwide problem. That there was like a huge issue with um, guinea worm. But, okay, I can't say it was worldwide, but it was a huge problem in Africa. Um, but what happened was there were millions of people every year that were having these infections over and over and over and over and over and over, and over again and <clears throat> way back when jimmy carter when he was president decided that this was unacceptable but he figured he found out what the life cycle of the guinea worm was and he found out that typically the problem is that they're they're drinking contaminated water so because they have unsafe water supplies these little water fleas they were in they were drinking the water fleas and then the water fleas go through the body and they go and become um little worms and they have an issue okay um and the the worm will leave they'll leave the body um out of the skin when you go into the water again um and so <clears throat> then they'll go and they'll lay more eggs and cause more things to go into the eggs going or the larvae go into the the water fleas and then the people drink more water and then we go over and over and over again okay um so <clears throat> what he found out was that if they just had safe water to drink then they could eliminate a lot of this issue so because um they don't have a lot of running water um well safe wells and things and they get a lot of their water from streams and rivers and carry it back daily on top of their head and whatnot um <clears throat> He was like, okay, well, I can't disinfect an entire river. I can't get rid of the water fleas. True. 
can't do that. So what I can do is I can provide them with filters so that when they are drinking water, they can at least be safe and it can filter out these water fleas so that they won't have to worry about it anymore. And that's what he did. So you'll notice that there's a little rope around their necks and then there's this tube, which is a filter, and they are drinking from really muddy water, but it's water and they have water and it's fresh water. Um, but they're siphoning out, <clears throat> filtering out all this crap that could cause them problems. Okay, so um, in 1986, we had like millions of cases okay in 2014 it was down to 126 cases okay um i can't remember and I, I did look this up uh a while back and i think it was down to like 54 cases um at that point in time so it it keeps going down it keeps going down they just have to like be really good about keep going with these these filters as long as you have these filters you don't have to worry about it now the problem is that um <clears throat> if the problem goes away people forget that we ever had the problem in the first place so why am i running around with this filter on my neck we haven't seen that for years right the water fleas haven't gone away okay um so it's you they still have to continue to filter and filter and we need to provide safe drinking water to a lot of different places so but as in the adults the adults can get up to three feet long you have to remove them a little at a time um you have to be very gentle, very um, slow while you're pulling, if you're pulling it out. Most of the time you take a stick and you wrap it around the stick. Um, and as you're, you're wrapping it, and sometimes it won't come all out at one time. So like if you wrap it around the stick and then it stops pull and it won't come anymore, you don't want to rip it all apart because then you could have little larvae go everywhere. Um, you just have to stop and wait and try again the next day and pull a little bit more and pull a little bit more. Um, so we remove them over a course of a couple of days. Um, but typically those adults, they like to go back to the water to be able to um, lay their larva, birth their larva, so that then they can get into the water fleas, blah, blah, blah. Um, hookworm. Oh, crap. Okay. Um hate that. Um this hang on one second. Hold on. Okay, I got it fixed. Um so for hookworm, hookworm is called it is known as ground itch because um typically you get it from walking barefoot on the ground sand soil whichever um or if you're not barefoot if you're con if there's contact with the soil or the sand or whatever and there are um little critters in that soil or sand and they get on your skin they can enter through the skin okay so the little the larvae will crawl in through openings in the skin um and what will happen is that they will grow into adults and your feet will be very itchy um and it is the itchiness was associated with contact with the ground therefore it is called ground itch so hookworms um anticyclostoma duodenale um i always say cyclostoma anticyclostoma duodenale um is old world Hookworm, which is associated with Europeans, Brazil, um, Mediterraneans, that's where it's found. The New World hookworm is in the Americas, West Africa, and the South Pacific, um, and that is Nicator americanus. So in the Americas is americanus. 
okay? And Silastoma is old world, all right? So what do we see? Um, <clears throat> this is what you would see if you saw an adult. This is what you see if you see the eggs. These are um, embryonated fertilized eggs, okay? This is what we see most commonly. If we're lucky enough to see one of these guys, and you have a way of looking at the buccal cavity, um, you need to know if they have buccal plates or nicator or the little hooks or teeth. They look like teeth, right? For encylostomas, okay? And then at the other end, um, where the reproductive process, reproductive organs are, then you'll see two different, um, morphologies. But for the most part, this is what we look for. Buccal cavity, this is what we see, um, at the mouth, and then, but probably 90% of the time we don't see worms anyway, but we find this. Okay. <clears throat> okay. And then there is Strongyloides stercalis. stercalis. Um, Strongyloides uh, is very similar to a hook, hookworm, um, but morphologically different, different life cycle, blah, blah. Um, but they look a little similar. If you were to go back, look at this worm, and then look at this worm. They kind of look similar except for in the throat area for stercoralis we have this wide wide area then it thins out then it gets wide again um i forget what the heck that thing is called but that's what we look for um and so if you see the larva in the stool this is what you're going to see if you see an egg you're going to see um a worm um, an embryo, larva, right, inside this very thin uh, egg. All right, so for filaria, um, filaria are differentiated very easily by looking at the two ends. Um, you look at the tail, you look at the head. Um, and the very first thing that you have to know is whether or not they have a sheath or not. Um, <clears throat> so you'll notice these guys just have the one line around them and they don't have excess, okay? So these are unsheathed. The ones that are sheathed are the Wuxaria, Bancroftii, Loa Loa, and Brugia Malliae. Okay, Malayi. Okay, sorry. Um, these guys have a sheath. Okay. Um, once you know if they have a sheath or not, and you're like, okay, well, it's either these three or these four. Boom, easy. Sheath, yes, okay. Brugia loa or wuchir. Um, then you have to look at the tails. Heads don't give you so much on this. It's always the tail. So you notice that Wuxeria Bancrofty has these couple dots and then there's an empty space at the end, right? That's how you identify him. Loa Loa has little dots that go all the way to the end, okay, in singles. And then Brugia Malae, Malae has little dots that go all the way to the end, but they've got big spaces in between. Boom. That's it. That's how you identify these things. And what you do is, if you have this available, if you have this little picture, um, that's it. That's that's how it goes. Okay. So, again, um, when you're looking at the ones that are unsheathed, Mancinella per stands has a double layer of dots. Osari has single dots don't go all the way to the end and it's not a pointy tail it's rounded right um on show circa volvulus very long tail lots of space at the end 
Okay, so the lots of space at the end. Onto onto circa. Okay, a little bit of space with a sheath. Whoosh area. It's really not that hard. This one single dots all the way down, all the way down, single dots all the way down to the very end. Um, is that Mancinella streptocerca. Really not hard. Okay. Um, so what is filariasis? Um, so these are little round worms that are in, they get into the, the tissues and into the lymphatic system. And the lymphatic system allows them to distribute throughout the body. Um, <clears throat> so Wuchiria bancroftii is typically in tropical areas. Brugia malayi, Malaysia, right? It's in the in Asia. Um, Ancho circa um, causes river blindness, mostly in Africa. Um, and there's a little bit in Latin America and a little bit in Middle East. Um, Loa loa. The, and Mancinella streptocerca perstans, um, they're in Africa. Perstans is also in South America. Ozardi is only on the American continent. Okay. So, um, I liked this one, so I decided that I was going to, like, stick it in the PowerPoint so you guys could, would have it. But, um, going back now to the PowerPoint. So it's there. It's it's pretty good for what happens. But Wisheria Bancrofti are typically in the tropical regions. Um carried <clears throat> from person to person or infecting people to people by mosquito bites that because these little microfilaria are in your lymphatics circulatory system. So mosquito comes and bites you, goes to another person, bites them, um, and there's that release of your lymphatic fluid into them. Boom! There you go. Um, so easy enough that it can go through from person to person. Okay. Um, so in Malaysia, in the in Asia, um, Abruzzia malae does the same thing. It causes a condition called elephantiasis, which means that they're blocking up some of the lymphatic vessels and the fluid doesn't drain well. So this is what happens and you get a lot of swellings. Okay. Loa loa is typically in, um, typically found in Africa. Um, transmission typically happens during the day by flies. Same thing with that Anchocerca um, volvulus again flies that are transmitting from person to person loa loa head tends to um the flies will bite people then you know how they lick their little hands and stuff um and then they walk on people's faces and uh then the little tiny microfilaria or larvae can settle into eyes. Loa loa is, is really good for that. It's the eye infecting one. Um, <clears throat> but again, can also cause elephantiasis. That's it. Done.